Hi, and welcome back to The Shack. I've not put a video up lately, and I can only apologise for that. However, this does not mean no progress has been happening. I've been hard at work building fixtures and writing test code to improve our test setup so we can evaluate the performance of the Boudicca transverter. However, I think before we do that, it's worth doing another RF Basics video, and this one is going to be on intermodulation distortion. Now, I'm afraid this is going to absolutely ruin any sort of uh, YouTube viewer attention, in that I'm going to warn you that it involves quite a lot of maths. Nerd! And specifically, quite a lot of trigonometry. No, God! No, God, please, no! So for the two of you that are still here, let's head over to the computer and have a look what we mean. So before we take a detailed look at what intermodulation distortion means, we should first consider the case of an amplifier that has no intermodulation distortion, and then work our way up. And an amplifier with no intermodulation distortion is called a linear amplifier. And um, what a linear amplifier means is the output is just some multiple of the input. So if we had an input, so here we've got a sine wave with an amplitude of capital A and an angular frequency, so 2 pi times the frequency of omega. Well, if we put a sine omega t in, then we're going to get some gain, which I've called A subscript 1 here, times our input signal. So A1 times capital A sine omega t. And if we were to make the input bigger or smaller, well, the output would scale by exactly the same amount. You know, if we doubled the size of the input, the output would double in amplitude as well. And if we look at that in time and frequency domain, what we've got here is in time domain. And you can see I've got an input frequency of 5 hertz, and I can sort of slide this up and down. And if we go up to 10, you can see we get more and more cycles in this one second window and also on the Fourier transform. So we've got the Fourier transform of the input here and of the output here. And right now we've got a gain of one if we give it some slightly positive gain. So let's get a gain of two, which is equivalent to six dB. You can see that we've got our input signal with an amplitude of zero dB and our output signal with an amplitude of six dB. And as I move this around in frequency, you can see this tracks as well. Now, most amplifiers, in fact all amplifiers, are non-linear to some extent, and that is that they will also amplify the square of the input and the cube of the input. So taking the scenario where we have quadratic gain, i.e. the output is not just, you know, gain times our input signal, it's also another gain constant times the input signal squared. Well, we can multiply out this bracket and get this term, and then we can use a standard trig identity for this bit in orange. This is equivalent to this. And that gives us three terms at our output. So we've got a single tone in, but we're getting the output at three different frequencies. We have a component at DC. We have a component. This is our linear gain. So A1A times sine, times sine omega t. And then we get this term at 2 omega t, so at twice the frequency of our input signal. Now, an important thing to note here is that both our DC term and our component at 2 omega scale as the input amplitude, so this capital A squared. So these are going to grow and shrink much, much faster than the actual wanted tone here. And in dB terms, if it grows as something squared, it'll grow twice as quickly in terms of dB. So if we go back to our plot, same settings as before, except now we have this extra term for squared gain, which is currently set to zero. So we have our input signal, and we have our perfect linear amplifier with a gain of two. And if we look in the frequency domain, you know, we've got our input at five hertz, our output at five hertz, six dB bigger. Now, let's add a little bit of gain to the squared term. And you can see that our two terms, one DC and one at two times the frequency, so here at 10 hertz, are appearing. And one of the important things to note here is if I bring this down to a nice number, so if we bring this down to one, you can see that it's distorting in the time domain too, but it's distorting asymmetrically. You know, it looks like it sort of shifted the whole curve up. And if I were to make this bigger, you can see that the whole curve has shifted asymmetrically. So this kind of distortion tends not to be really common in amplifiers. Um, you sometimes get it if, say, you have a split positive and negative supply, and you, one of them isn't quite at the right voltage. So you can sort of see 
here where the bottom is almost flat you know that almost looks like you're hitting a supply rail at the bottom end but the important thing is second order terms and by second order i mean things that are related to the input squared and generally grow as the input amplitude squared tend to cause asymmetry in the waveform which is quite unusual um, unless you're doing something really wrong so one thing that we should note here is to check that sort of doubling in db so if i bring this back down a little bit so you can see here that i've got my fundamental signal so my the five hertz that i'm putting in is at about zero db and my 10 hertz so two omega is at about minus 10. if i now halve my input amplitude so i bring this down to 0.5 you can see that my output at my wanted frequency here this has dropped by 6 db so a scale of a half however my component at 2 omega so my second order intermod has dropped by double that it's dropped by 12 db and this is because of that a squared thing we saw earlier and we get a similar effect with third order terms so things that are related to the input cubed now these tend to be a bit more common once again going through the maths we've got our input we've got our gain at cubic terms times the input cubed standard trig expansion this bit in orange is identical to this and then we get two outputs now it's quite important to note here that the component at our input frequency i.e the output we're wanting is now not just subject to our linear gain when we had quadratic you know this component here which was our wanted part of our output signal was exactly what we wanted from a linear amplifier it was the gain times the input and all our intermodulation distortion was at frequencies far away being at dc and twice the input frequency so it can be removed with filtering and you wouldn't know the difference the problem is here is the amplitude of our sine wave at our wanted frequency so at our five hertz in this case now has this additional term here and you notice it, that this scales as the input amplitude to the power of three and this generalizes that the the nth order harmonic will scale as input amplitude to the power of n and we have another component at three times our input frequency so if we go down and have a look once again we've got a fundamental gain of two and cubic gain so our a subscript three is currently set to zero now in practice that constant a subscript three tends to be negative so let's introduce just a small amount of it there we go and you can see a huge spike at three times our wanted frequency but if you keep a close eye on the output of our fundamental here at five hertz you can see as i make this gain larger that actually that amplitude is dropping and that's coming from this term here once again to prove our point let's try and set these up so these are at some nice numbers okay so i've got our output at our wanted signal is at zero and our output at three times that is at minus 20 and if i drop this by a factor of 6 db so take it to a half you can see that this has dropped by a little bit less than half and that's because the interaction of these two terms however this has dropped by three times that delta so we drop this by 6 db and this used to be at minus 20 and now it's dropped by 6 times 3 18 db so our third order intermod here is scaling as three times in db our input amplitude now one of the key things here is it's quite hard to spot this you know if you just looked at this on a sign or on an oscilloscope you'd struggle to spot there's quite significant amounts of distortion if our output is looking fairly close to you know what you'd expect to see as a sine wave despite having you know this third harmonic product that's sort of only 20 db down so completely unacceptable for any sort of regulatory purposes so if we up our input amplitude again you can see at sort of high input amplitudes this is distorted heavily and you know if i get to there you can see that we're dominated by three times our input frequency as we can see in the FFT. Now, the reason that we tend to care more about third order intermods or specifically odd order intermodulation, they all end up with this product, is that they produce results that actually end up close to our wanted signal. Let's take a slightly more extreme example. Let's put in two sine waves together. And you know, this is perfectly reasonable if we were transmitting something like SSB, you know, our, our signal is going to be a complicated mixture of of components at multiple frequencies so you know easily more than two 
So the maths for this gets sort of even more tedious. But once again, we've got our input, we get our linear term here, and our third order gain times our input cubed. This orange bit expands to this large mess. And then I've gone and copied the line and sort of highlighted the bits of that separately and expanded each of those out individually. Now, that quite a lot of laborious maths, but the output we get is quite interesting. So it's these four lines and I've kind of grouped them together into what they are. So we get our wanted signals, so the two sine waves we're putting in. And again, we have this sort of, you know, the, the linear gain we wanted and some sort of compressive gain. So as the input gets larger, you know, if A3 is negative, as I've asserted, then, you know, we'll, our output power at our wanted frequencies will be below what we expect. And this is quite a common thing. People designing amplifiers often care about P1dB. So the power at which the output you're getting is 1 dB below what you are expecting, i.e. where this term here is having the effect of being minus 1 dB as if from if you just had that. And that's one of the ways to assess this sort of onset of serious amounts of intermod. You then get these terms here, and these are in-band third order intermod. Third order because they're related to the input cubed. And th the reason these are a pain is that the frequency they're at. You can see here we've got 2 omega 1 minus omega 2 and 2 omega 2 minus omega 1. Well, given that omega 1 and omega 2 are roughly the same if they're both components of our wanted signal, so this is going to have a frequency that's very close to where omega 1 and omega 2 are. We then get some components of out-of-band third-order intermod, and these are at 2 omega 1 plus omega 2, so about three times our input frequency. So we're not worried about those, we can easily filter them, and we get some third harmonics as well. So these top two are kind of the issues. The the gain compression we get from this term here, and this sort of in-band intermod that we struggle to get rid of. Going once again to our trusty graphs, you know, the blue here is the time domain of two sine waves added together. And for here, I've gone for 20 hertz and 23 hertz. Um, it's generally a good idea if you're doing this sort of testing to make them not harmonically related or be like multiples of each other. Um, just because sometimes for higher order intermod you get terms mixing together. So let's have a look. So we've got a fundamental gain of 2, so again we've got our input with our two tones and our output that is 6 dB larger. Let's add a small amount of gain here, and again I've claimed it's negative, and you can see all these extra tones have popped up. So first thing to notice is our two wanted signals. As I add some third order, you can see the output power dropped a little bit there. And we've now got two extra tones, and these are our problematic in-band ones. So you've got 2 omega 1 minus omega 2, and you've got 2 omega 2 minus omega 1. And then you've got a third harmonics here and here, and then you've got the 2 omega 1 plus omega 2 and 2 omega 2 plus omega 1. So that's all the terms that we are expecting accounted for. So what does this look like as we sweep the input power? So what I've done here is I'm a instead of looking in terms of frequency or time, what I'm now doing is increasing the input power and I'm looking how much output power I'm getting. Now the orange line is what I'm getting at the two frequencies of my wanted signal. So these two here, the ones that I'm trying to amplify. And I've gone and done a sort of linear line in this dotted blue. So this would be what would happen if the amplifier was perfectly linear as I scaled my input. So you can see here I've got minus 40 and I'm getting an output here of minus 34 because I've got 6 dB of gain and this would just be go on as a straight line forever. And I've got my third order intermod, sometimes written down as IMD3, so intermodulation distortion, so third order products. And because of that capital A cubed that we get, this is growing three times quicker. What we can also see here is our gain compression. So this is our P1dB as our output is dips below what we'd expect. And this is coming from this sort of this term here being negative. Now, this is a mathematical simplification. You won't ever see it sort of come back up like this. By the time you're, you've seen 
got much past P1DB, your amplifier's gone horribly non-linear, and all these sort of assumptions as to how it's working have completely gone out the window. So kind of ignore the orange and the green lines from sort of this point onwards. However, they do give us a theoretical point that we use to try and quantify this non-linearity, and it's the point that these two lines theoretically cross, and we call this IP3. So IP3 or OIP3 is the output power at which these cross, so somewhere here, and IIP3, so the input third order inset point, is, if you drop this vertically, the input power that you would get for these two to cross. Now in reality you'd never ever put the input power that high, and in reality you'd never actually manage to get the third order terms to be equal to the linear terms, because your amplifier's behaviour would have completely changed from this point onwards, but it's a nice way to quantify it. And you can see here that if I set my qubit gain to sort of small, you can see this number has has gone up, so we're now at sort of IP3 of sort of 20 dBm, and as I bring it this way, you know, that intercept point is tracking down here. So this is what it looks like in theory, and here's what it looks like in practice. So what we have here is the Boudicca board, and I've got these, this SMA and this one are across one of its internal amplifiers. And I've got the output here going to a spectrum analyzer that we'll go over to in a second, and the input I'm going to feed with this board. And what this is doing is combining the output of two signal generators, so each one's generating a tone at slightly different frequencies, and we, this is combining them together, so my waveform here should be two clean tones, added together. So I'm going to plug this in like so and now we go over to the spectrum analyzer and if I turn both signal generators on there's one there's two and you can see what it looks like here is you know it's struggling to separate that there are two distinct tones there and you just get this weird shape and that's what this property calls RBW or resolution bandwidth is and what I can do is I can make that smaller and its ability to resolve those two tones you know gets better and sort of there it's sort of there and if I drop it to 100 kilohertz, you can now clearly see these are two distinct tones. Now this comes at the expense of increasing this number in the bottom right, so that's your sweep time. So you can see it's sort of 30 milliseconds there, and 25 there. It can be more extreme on larger spans, but anyway, let's do that. So, there we go. Our amplifier is amplifying, and we're putting two tones in and getting two tones out. Now if I drop this, given that we're expecting to see any intermodulation, it'll be separated by the spacing of those two tones, but there doesn't seem to be anything yet. So let's up our signal levels and see what we get. So let's up this to minus 5 dBm on the low one, and minus 5 on the upper one. And you can see that right now we've got our intermod. So we put a marker there, you've got this is our fundamental, and we've got third order here, and we've got fifth order here. Because remember, odd number intermods will produce responses at the sort of frequencies close to where we care about. Now there's two ways we can work out what our third order intercept point is, so how we're going to quantify this as a single number. One of which is, well we've got this point here, of where our tone is, and we know that will grow, should grow linearly with the input power, and we've got our third order here, which we know will grow three times as fast. So we can put those two points, you know, on a graph, extrapolate the lines, one with a gradient of one, one with a gradient of three, and we can see where they cross. And that's how this will do it. So if we ask it to measure TOI, third order intercept, you can see it's gone and spotted the tones, and it's giving us an intercept value in the bottom right there, somewhere in the region of 35 to 36 dBm. Now one thing to remember that's important when quantifying these sort of things is all amplifiers can produce intermod, and that includes those in the spectrum analyzer itself. And there's quite a simple way to test this, and this involves putting an attenuator in line with the input. So what I've done here is I've frozen the input in yellow, and pink is reading what is currently going on. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect my amplifier. So you can see there that my noise floor in pink has fallen and I've put a 10 dB attenuator in and I'm plugging it back in. Now the reason this tells us whether the intermod we're seeing comes from the spectrum analyzer or the amplifier was if it's already present in the cable by the time it leaves the amplifier, 
Well, then putting the attenuator in there will just drop all the tones by 10 dB. And you can see that's what it's done here. Both our fundamentals and our intermod have dropped by on the order of 10 dB. So we know the intermod is coming from the transverter. The reason for this was if the intermod was being generated in the spectrum analyzer itself, well, we know that our third order intermod drops as three times in dB as the input amplitude. So the attenuators drop the input amplitude by 10 dB, so we'd expect to see our third order intermods drop by 30 dB. But it, so that tells us that it's coming from the transverter and what we're taking is actually a meaningful measurement rather than just seeing how good the spectrum analyzer is. And just to round off this video to show what we're gonna be looking at when we actually start evaluating the board, what I've done is I've written some Python test scripts. And what it does is instead of just measuring it at one point, so you can see, for example, you could sort of measure it, say you set the tone input set point to minus 10 dBm, where you'd measure a sort of fundamental signal here and a third order intermod signal here, and you can put the lines on them and extrapolate, and you get the point where they cross. And this is saying sorry, plus 36 dBm, which is about what the spectrum analyzer gave using this method. However, you have to be very careful with this, because imagine if we'd taken the point here well, the green line would still be in the same place, but our line with a gradient of 3, so this orange dotted line, would now sort of be much higher, so it would be going up here. So this is why I've decided to do it this more complicated way, but it means I can actually get some good confidence looking at the results that what I'm seeing is meaningful. An example would be somewhere here. You can see that that doesn't look a really realistic point to try and extrapolate from. The reason being is up here where it allegedly has a gradient of 3, we've already got our compression here. So you can see the dotted green line is our theoretical linear gain, and we've sort of dropped from that significantly more than 1 dB. Unfortunately, trying to write code to match a line with a gradient of 3 to an arbitrary point in this was quite tricky. I mean, in reality, the actual line should probably be somewhere here and go on upwards, which would give us 36 dB similar to everywhere else. So that's all I've got for you today. Thanks very much for joining me. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and 73.